Hey, what's up, dancing lady Laura? How are you today? Great. Um, so we were just talking about Woodstock, and I, uh, I figured I'd uh, you know put it down. So like, what, uh, what what do you want to say about Woodstock? Well, the conversation that Rick and I were just having was about how Woodstock's one of the most awesome anti-ageist places, where it's way more awesome to be a late bloomer. Okay. Lots of 20-somethings come up with some cool creative thing, but you know, if you're 50, 60, 70, 80, and you all of a sudden blow out with some cool creative thing that's original, that's all yours, it actually does come with age. You know, uh, it has a different kind of perspective. The people around here are like, wee <laughs> So there's no such thing as like, oh, you know, you're blah age. And, you know, you think you're going to be a dancer at age 57? <laughs> no, instead it's the exact opposite. You know, my gray hair is way to my advantage. Um, you know, would that be true other places? You know, no, I'm not going to go to Brooklyn and compete with uh, all the students from Alvin Ailey and Juilliard and all of that kind of thing. But, yeah, Scott Mitchell uh, yesterday at Colony. And was like, wow, this is Dancing Lady Laura. She's the best dancer in this town. <laughs> so that's not necessarily every town. You're but, staking uh, your claim in the dancing game. Yeah, the dancing gig. And what a great article for AARP. But yes, in my previous life, I wasn't just an upstanding middle-class professional person. I worked on the business side of media companies. So the other people are the creative people, but I'm the one who has to get their vision and get it into the real world, no matter what that means. And so I used to say, my day job is making other people's dreams come true. What I'm doing here in Woodstock, yes, I'm, I was born in 1963. <laughs> and this has just developed over the last two or three years. It started in Richmond, Virginia, and it's continuing on here, is coming out as Dancing Lady Laura. It doesn't matter if I can't do high kicks. That's not what it's about. You know, what it's about is uplifting other people through my dance. I don't even know what I'm doing when I'm dancing, but as long as other people are uplifted, happy, um, getting other people to dance. But it's you do, a, you pure, do it pretty good, it's a yeah. pure creative. You make it, people feel like they want to dance, you know? Yes, it's never my intention to intimidate other people with my dancing. Yeah. That can be a thing with any creative person where they're just like, yeah. oh, I'm intimidating you with my technical. You got, you got the uplifting mint going. Got the uplifting bit going where even if you're not dancing, I want you to feel happy, uplifted, spiritually uplifted. It's good. It's a, it's a spiritual program. And this is Woodstock. Yeah. It's Everyone a good thing. from somewhere else who comes here is on a spiritual quest. So, you know, however it comes out, but, um, yes, I don't, <laughs> you I, I, couldn't, different. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't take somebody else's choreography. I can't, I don't even choreograph what I do myself, but yeah, this is a, you know, unique opportunity for me here now at this stage in my life where I'm making my own dream come true. And it's not a dream I came up with on my own. It's something I started doing. I could see others were uplifted by it and happy about it. And yeah. other people started calling me dancing lady. And so I'm, it's my give back. That's the way I can give back. It's good. While also it's uplifting on a physical, emotional, you know, on all planes. So, yeah, you definitely yeah. helped me out with some stuff, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Uh, so, Only pause positive, live music. <laughs> yeah. So, question for you. Like, I know we were talking earlier, too, about just, like, the whole AJ to chaos thing and the vortex of it all. Like, it, <laughs> do you want to tell anybody out there, like, any kind of a piece of advice to stay away from that kind of shit or what? Uh, yes. All right, so this is the way it goes. Um, you know, some people call it good versus evil, but... Uh, uh, less charged way of thinking about it is you're either on the side of positivity and creativity and it's very difficult to bring anything creative and make it real okay that can be 
sabotaged in any moment. <laughs> okay, it takes energy, it takes a lot of energy. Um, then there's the other side, the side of chaos, is the side of chaos and destruction. So agents of chaos out of, um, first of all, jealousy, because they're wastrels, they never do anything themselves. They never accomplish things in the world. They talk about it. Okay, that's called pipe dreams. You know, you can waste it and talk about all these great things you're gonna do but never doing it. Um, and then also to the, um, they're always seeking negative attention. So they get a cathartic experience out of destroying and sabotaging anything that somebody who's on this side is trying to accomplish. So the sabotage can take many forms it's very insidious often these people um they don't think of themselves as bad at all actually it's very confusing they often ask for help they often you know they would some of them would be horrified to look at themselves as being destructive um but yeah the way you can tell an agent of chaos is you're trying to get something going and then all these obstacles and chaos and trauma, drama, um, things get lost and destroyed that are necessary for you to do your vision. Yes, Jeffrey, did he take Joe's guitar and explode it with fireworks so Joe is incapable of making music? He might have. Yeah. You know, that is something that these agents of chaos will do. They'll prevent you from achieving your goals. And so um, the only, there's no point in trying to talk sense to them. Uh, will they turn around on their own? Who knows? So it's very avoidance is the only policy. Avoidance, wide birth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to just, whoa. And there is a small core group of uh, you know, chaotic people in, in Woodstock. We got a live one over there. Yeah. Um, but the, the ones who are here, it's very poignant, the town, uh, sort of supports them and allows them to be here because if they were not so chaotic, they all, there never was. They all could have been something or there has been. Okay, so the town doesn't tolerate just crackheads from Kingston or anything like that. You know, even Jeffrey actually can play the guitar. You see what I mean? The, they, they could have been something and I think that that's why the town sort of takes pity on them. And, Let's them say, but there's really only like what a dozen hardcore ones of them you just avoid them. <laughs> gotcha, but gotcha. It's very necessary, yeah. Well, um, wh what do you got to say about the nature up here? I'm looking at this pond over here and it's just crazy. Well, it's awesome. You know, um, I wrote a song, Look at the Chipmunk, so the town is completely overrun with chipmunks, much to my delight. <laughs> my friend Joe loves ravens, they're all over the place the ravens and the eagles, the um. Uh, yes, this, the stream, the everything, the magical mountain. Um, yeah, this is, you know, this has got to be one of the most beautiful towns as far as, you know, nature setting goes. Yeah, I don't Neil think it gets any Neil better. set up a, a beer garden and what is behind it? A beautiful, spectacular, historic cemetery. Oh, yeah. I think Yvonne Helm is in there. Yeah, he is. Set he... against a, a mountain. Yeah, you, know, he, like, he, you, you can't do a beer garden like that everywhere. That's <laughs> nah, anywhere. true. I mean, it's just like. <laughs> yeah, Levon's in there. Rick Danko's in there. Yeah. Levon's right over by where they chill. It's like that yeah. spot, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like literally like two feet from where they are. Right. That's kind of part of the. Kind of the, ironic. The, the, you know, the magic, you know, the magic of this, of this town. Yeah. So, like there's a big influx of, there are people, you know, from Brooklyn, a lot of people from Brooklyn coming in to this controversy about uh, gentrification. Yeah, I, did Brooklyn get real hit by that? Because I know my town did. Yeah, and I, I assume even more people from Brooklyn would come, and I relate to that because I used to live in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and when I lived in Brooklyn, I always was just like, oh, maybe I'll move to Woodstock. So it's not like they're coming up with this idea. They will always have this idea. You know, the people who, the RD people in Brooklyn, they don't never went to the Hamptons. They've always just come upstate. So, it's, you know, gotcha. there's a mass migration from Brooklyn here. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I've sensed that and I always <laughs> wondered what that was. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, so, question, um, what were you just saying right before? Oh, gentrification. That's happening all over the country right now. Yeah, gentrification is happening all over the country. And, and it's so... It, it, and it's really weird too because it's part of the... Um, squeezing out of the middle yeah you know, so you know squeezing out of the you know like the middle 
class yeah. because you think, oh, you know, look at the economy. Uh, where are these people who have this money to do all this? <laughs> I guess they all yeah. just come here. So, well, it, um, yeah. uh, see, this is what I don't understand yet, and I'm still trying local, to. Local people, I just they hate Airbnb. Of, friend of mine might have, has a property she's renovating and she's like I'm not going to do Airbnb because I was just like there's no place for local people well quite qu question about the gentrification like like how does that tie in with what's going on with the government because there has to be some link I know in my hometown you could see the link between the police and the gentrification but I don't know where the politics come into all that and how it um, all works yeah but see that's not really a problem here and I can right. go on record the, um, the Woodstock Police Department is awesome <laughs> detective Amoroso you rock um, they are actually very patient and kind with um, the people that they know that they know are not, you know, hardcore, cri hardcore criminals are not allowed in this town. They get chased away instantly. So even when I was talking about the agents of chaos, you know, they know that they're just like hapless drunks or take too much acid or whatever. And, you know, they are you know, as patient and kind with them as they can be. Um, but like, this but is this is not the place. Where, this is the place where the cops are cool. But um, but I'm saying, like, like, like inside the country, like, 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 what is it? What is it that connects all this gentrification? Like, what is going on? Oh well, it's the it's like the Gilded Age because um, the the system after World War II that created a huge middle class right has gotten squeezed out. So we're now back like with the robber barons where, you know, they're the wealthy people and the not wealthy people, but the middle class is being like this big is getting a little more like this. So yeah. people who previously had a lot of, you know, GI Bill, here's your free college education instead of owing, you know, $70,000. <laughs> you know, yeah, see yeah. what I mean? Like those, those kinds of support don't exist it's crazy. so um yeah you know the people who work in this uh they used to be able to afford places in town you know but um that's getting uh scarcer scarcer and scarcer so they find a place outside of town they have to commute in and blah blah, blah you know like that so, okay all right um but uh you know it's it's you know it's good and bad um you know i when I say I lived in Brooklyn, I was only able to live in like say the slope or I was in Hell's Kitchen in East Village after there was like a little bit of gentrification because I can't deal with too much of a rough and tumble environment where there might be like a scary flop house or something around. <laughs> but it's just that then there gets a point where it's too gentrified for me. Um, and I think a lot of uh, creative artistic people, there is a sort of sweet spot. Like you don't want things to be too rough. Yeah. But you don't want to get priced out yet, and I think it's kind of hard to yeah. to hold a place in that little sweet spot yeah. because the, the sweet spot. Well, the arty people come and they fix up properties, right? And then the rich people buy them. <laughs> That's the process of gentrification. Is always some arty people come in, uh, you're clean right. up the neighborhood, and then the rich people aren't afraid of the arty people because yeah. they're not scary. And then they've turned it up. Um, yeah, I was just, uh, he shall remain nameless, but I was just talking to somebody who was uh, talking to the owner of it. It's like an abandoned gas station or something, but he's a sculptor and an architect. And he's just like, wow, you know, I could go in there and, you know, these rich people don't have any vision, but I could turn it into a, a cool artist studio and fix it up this, that, and the other thing, and all of a sudden it would be worth a million dollars. Yeah, yeah. Know I know what you're saying, though, that, because but, the yeah. way things do flow, it, it usually does come along. Somebody comes along, does something nice, and somebody comes in and buys it. Well, I did that with a property that yeah. I, I bought an apartment in Park Slope that had been rented. It, was, it looked totally trashed out. Um, this is what I was talking to this guy about, um, where... The, yeah, the back, okay, the backyard was just cement, there was a mattress, empty liquor bottles, blah, blah. I didn't see any of that. All I saw was that there was an old iron fence and a hundred year old rose bush. So I had the whole thing ripped up and made it awesome. And then I sold it to somebody who wouldn't have seen that with their eyes. They, yeah, yeah. All they would see is the mattress and the liquor bottles, which can be removed. They yeah, didn't yeah. see the groovy hundred year old rose bush. Yeah. I saw it, yeah, right. I got you. Yeah.